figuring out what the ideology was. When it became Christian moral ethic proper, then it is. It just is, if that makes, if that makes sense. Okay, so um, absolute knowledge was adequate, right? It created a sense of complacency. If we have a sense of absolute knowledge, right? And if absolute knowledge is, it's not necessarily the, the trajectory for me. I know as a human being that I'll never attain absolute knowledge. But if I believe that there is this thing, absolute knowledge, and it does exist in the universe, probably in the Godhead, then I, there is a sense in which I'm complacent because all things will make sense in time, right? So that when we're talking about the evils and the atrocities of the world, right, and the fact that, you know, one person uh, is killing another person, right, or has killed another person, right, then I say, well, you know, the evils that exist in this world are, are in the grand scheme, right, in, in, as part of this established dogma, right, there's sense to be made. I don't have the knowledge, the absolute knowledge necessary to make sense of the evils in the world. So, you know, a young girl, you know, seven, six years old, comes home from the school bus, she gets abducted, raped, murdered, brutalized, chop her body up, you know, throw her, feed her to the dogs. On an extreme case, an, an advocate, and I've done a lot of research on this, so I know that there is an argument to this, I'm not gonna get into it. There is a universal um, justification, if you will, because in some sense her pain uh, you know, outweighs some of the other, I don't know. And that's where I tap out, because it just, you know, it doesn't, the argument, the belief is that evils are, in a cosmic level, justified, because we don't have total um, epistemological knowledge. There is this absolute knowledge, and if we only had that absolute knowledge, then we would see why the evils are justified. And typically the argument reduces to free will or some sort of perverse notion of free will that you gotta have free will so that evil exists and blah blah blah. But then it's just like, no, I'd rather just live in a world where I wasn't free and we didn't have little girls getting chopped up and thrown in backs. I, you know, I'd rather just be a robot. You know, being, being free is a little overrated anyway. You know, if that's what we mean. A whole other side issue, but that's the, <laughs> that's the nature of the, the, the complication and the argument, right? So, um, it's powerful because it's absolute knowledge, right? We don't have to, we can become complacent. Listen, you know, crap happens in the world, uh, and, and this is being facetious, but you know, there's, there are evils that happen in the world, and yeah, it would do us good to try and make amends for some of the evils in the world, but in truth, we don't have total knowledge, and our lack of knowledge is, is limiting our understanding uh, and preventing some of these evils. Okay, so that's number three. My phone is ringing, and it's driving me crazy. Number four, um, the Christian moral hypothesis, no, so number four of um, the first four in, uh, the, the last in, at the top of page two, the Christian moral hypothesis was a means of preservation, and this is in the original, the italics in the notes is in the original. The Christian moral hypothesis was a means of preservation. Um, the next point, uh, so I'll put preservation here. Preservation. Christian morality became the cure, if you will, for practical and theoretical nihilism. And the question is, well, what is being preserved? When, when Nietzsche says Christian moral um, hypothesis is a means of preservation, what are we trying to preserve, right? And why is it so important, important that this thing um, is preserved? There are many things that this could refer to. To be honest, um, and this might just be a limitation of my knowledge, so I mean, I know a lot of people know Nietzsche, so if you're watching the video at this point and you think you have a good idea of other things that it might include, please respond. But there are a number of things that can be preserved. The first thing that can be preserved, obviously, is perfection. Right? We want to preserve the perfection of God. We want to preserve the perfection of the dogma. Right? Uh, there's something to the effect of um, nothing can be taken or added from the text, something to that effect. So the dogma in and of itself is a perfect document, right, as document, much less ideology, right? So we want to preserve perfection. What else do we want to preserve? Uh, we want to preserve God's uh, goodness, right? We want to preserve love. We want to preserve power. And most importantly, I would say we want to preserve uh, knowledge. Right? 
there are many, many things. I'm, you know, there are more than this, this, but these are some of the first things that come to my mind. Right? With respect to preservation, we want to have, if we are talking about, and not even if, since we are talking about an ethic, and we recognize that an ethic is the distinction between what ought to be the case, GHT, and what is the case, right? We go from is to ought, then what ought to be the case, this is a, this is espoused by and justified by um, the Christian moral ethic, right? CME, right? It's espoused by the Christian moral ethic, right? This becomes the established dogma. S right? So the Christian moral ethic becomes the established dogma. Insofar as we're preserving perfection, we're preserving goodness, we're preserving love, we're preserving power, we're preserving knowledge, then the evils of this world, right? the horrors, the murders, the brutality, the genocide, the whatever, all make sense in and within the established dogma. Right? It all makes sense. We can make sense of it because if we were to have perfection ourselves as the highest good, as the greatest good, right? Um, if we had complete knowledge, right? if we were like God, theoretically, I mean, it's probably blasphemous to even say that, um, then we would understand that, you know, it's not really evils, it's, and this is the idea, right? And this is, this is really what Nietzsche is going to get upset about, right? And among many other things. But at its root, it's like, no, this is what's going to piss him off. It's like, th this is ridiculous. This is not me. This is Nietzsche, right? So um, just, a, just a, an aside, right? Um, the Christian moral hypothesis was a means of preservation. What are we attempting to preserve? A whole lot of stuff. Why is it important to preserve that? Because we're talking about an ethic. What is an ethic? The distinction between what is and what ought. We live in is. Ought is where, we, where we're going. This is becoming... And this is being. Right? So this is becoming, this is being, and this is where we need to go. So that we're going towards this, this, uh, this, um, this sense of preserving all that is good. And insofar as we get closer, we have a more holistic understanding. But Nietzsche obviously says that you know this um, this leads to nihilism as as far as he's concerned, right? This is the root. Right? This is the root, because the, the highest value is itself, right? something that devaluates itself, and I'll talk more about that um, later. So Christian morality became the cure for practical and theoretical nihilism. Okay, two more points and then we're done. Um, morality created and cultivated the notion of truthfulness, right? For Nietzsche, the idea of morality created, it cultivated, it served as, it served as the hotbed, if you will, for this idea of truthfulness. Be truthful. Here's what truthfulness, and truthfulness as, to be specific, a fixed state of affairs, right? A very fixed understanding of truthfulness, absolute truthfulness, if you will. So, and that's the first point, right? So, the first thing is that we have this idea now of truthfulness, T-R. U T H F U L. Right, we have this idea of truthfulness as an absolute. Right, obviously that absolute is what I'm headed towards. You know, I'm lying a little bit. I know I shouldn't do it. I I ought not to do it. You know, but I am in this particular state. So let me let me aspire for a higher value, and that is to be absolutely truthful. Right, so we all should aspire to be absolute absolutely truthful. There was actual, wasn't there a movie? There was a movie, yeah, it was, uh, Jim Carrey had a movie about, <laughs> it was perverse, I gotta go check that out, I forget, Liar Liar or something like that, where he was, he invented lying or something, I'm, I'm forgetting Ricky Gervais and Jim Carrey, but there were a few comedians that sort of pounced on the absurdity of having absolute truthfulness as your highest value, as just an example, right, if absolute truth as a very obvious, sort of simplistic, overly generalized example, if you have absolute truth as your highest value and your wife comes to you or your spouse comes to you and says, hey, sweetheart, how do you, what do, you do you like my hair? And you really think, you know, it's nice, but I like the old one better, the old style better. And you say, oh, well, you know, it's nice, but I like the old style better. Get ready for war. 
So you tell a lot, you're like, oh no, you know, it, it looks good, it looks great, I love it. And, you know, just to preserve the peace. So the idea of having absolute truth as the highest value devalues the notion of truth because now we're going to have way more heart, uh, hurt feelings, we're going to have way more conflict because people are going to be offended and upset that you're telling them the truth, right? Um, nobody wants to create a moral ethic of lying, but the truth is, you know, you're doing a disservice if you posit absolute truth as the highest possible value with respect to truth. So this, this is sort of, again, this is sort of the structure. I'm just trying to get you comfortable with an understanding of what's going on uh, in the text. So truthfulness is an absolute value. Next point, truthfulness is the perfection of morality. Again, perfection pops up, right? So truthfulness is absolute truthfulness as perfection. Um, insofar as we believe in morality, we believe in the absolute perfection of truth. This is a very, very important point, right? Insofar as we believe in morality, we believe in the absolute perfection of truth. Um, and many people are going to disagree with this claim, and I, I want to spend a little bit of time uh, discussing that. <laughs>